Hey everybody, Justin Cook here to talk to you guys about the latest film from acclaimed director Yorgos Lanthimos. Uh, certainly one of the major contenders in this year's Oscar race uh, that you'll be hearing a lot more about in the months to come. That movie is The Favorite, which stars Olivia Colman, Rachel Weisz, Emma Stone, and Nicholas Holt. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the ending of the movie and how it could be interpreted. Uh, so if you've seen the movie and have questions about it, or if you're just curious to hear about what happens at the end of the movie and haven't seen it, and how this movie can be interpreted, this video is for you. I was lucky enough to catch this movie at the Philadelphia Film Festival back in October, so I've had a lot of time to sit with this movie, specifically its last shot, which I'm sure is going to cause some confusion for viewers upon leaving the theater. I personally like this movie a good deal. I think The Lobster is still my favorite Yorgos Lanthimos movie I've seen, but this movie, uh, it sneakily stays with you. It's a hard one to shake. It left this very subtle but emotionally resonant impact on me, and I'm sure a lot of other people will feel the same way. I would definitely recommend it, so if you don't want this movie to be spoiled for you, click away from this video now, and then come back to it once you see this very idiosyncratic and on the surface perplexing movie ending. Alright, without much further ado, let's dive into it. So I'm going to start off by just giving some background on the plot. If you want to skip to the ending analysis, uh, there'll be a time code that you could click to. Um, but this is for people that haven't seen the movie and want some context as to what happens leading up to the ending. So The Favourite is a comedy drama based on a true story that follows the reign of Anne, Queen of Great Britain, played by Olivia Colman, uh, in the early 18th century when England is at war with the French. Anne is a frail, occasionally nasty, and weak-willed queen suffering from a number of health issues and all around unfit to rule, who leaves most of the big decisions in ruling England to her trusted advisor and best friend since childhood, the calculating and cunning Sarah Churchill, Duchess of Marlborough. Sarah is played by Rachel Weisz, and Sarah's relationship with the Queen is one built around candidness and honesty, and unlike many of the Queen's other advisors and confidants, Sarah isn't above harshly criticizing the Queen to her face, and deals with her with a surprising lack of flattery, as well as moments of true sympathy and kindness as well. The two are secretly engaged in a romantic relationship with one another too. Not before long, along comes Abigail Hill, played by Emma Stone, the young cousin of Sarah's who hails from the countryside and was gambled away by her father in a game of cards, and she seeks employment in the castle. Though initially seeming harmless and being given menial work around the castle, Abigail is taken under the wing of Sarah. Abigail finds out about the Queen and Sarah's lesbian relationship and she slowly reveals herself to be just as cunning as Sarah, if not even more ambitious. Abigail gains more face time with the Queen, first playing with the Queen's 17 rabbits that she owns, 17 for each of her 17 dead children, and Abigail soon starts complimenting her and performing sexual favors for her as well. For example, when the Queen asks Sarah if she can quote, rub her leg, she knows that the Queen is really asking for one of these favors. Soon the Queen starts requesting Abigail come to her service instead of Sarah. When Sarah finds out about the two's relationship, Abigail is released from her service, but Abigail manipulates the Queen into keeping her on board despite what Sarah said. From here the movie turns into a war of the favorites, with Sarah and Abigail each attempting to outdo each other and gain the favor of the Queen, which culminates in Abigail poisoning Sarah and the poison taking effect while Sarah rides her horse, leading her to fall off her horse and be dragged on the ground. Uh, she nearly dies and disappears for a number of days while being nursed back to health. During this time, even Abigail begins to bind her own hype in a certain sense having throughout the movie forged a romantic relationship with a powerful courtier named Colonel Samuel Masham and a mutually advantageous political relationship with Robert Harley, 1st Earl of Oxford, who hopes to end England's involvement in the war. Abigail marries Colonel Masham with the Queen's blessing, becoming a lady. Sarah returns to the castle, where her word holds even less power than before, Abigail clearly being the favorite, and seeing her hold on the Queen starting to disappear, she blackmails the Queen, and says that she will release a series of letters that explicitly lay out their secret romantic relationship. Sarah comes to regret her confrontation with the Queen and ends up burning the letters. Um, as it is assumed, she realizes that the battle of wits with Abigail has turned her into a bit of a monster and made her lose sight of what made her relationship with the Queen so special in the first place. But as she does so, the Queen requests that she be removed from the castle at once and not be allowed back in. Sarah, kicked out of the Queen's cabinet, goes back home to her husband, where she writes a passionate letter to Queen Anne. Without Sarah to keep her in check, Abigail becomes sort of spoiled by living her high-status life, beginning to neglect her husband, who she once pretended to love dearly, to get him to marry her, and even makes up a lazy lie to further hammer the nail in Sarah's coffin by trying to convince the Queen that Sarah and her husband were stealing from her, uh, which the Queen at first can't believe. Abigail, back at the castle, prevents Sarah's letter from reaching the Queen, seeing that the Queen is starting to become lonely without Sarah and her candid honesty and friendship. Also, without Sarah, the Queen becomes even more and more despondent, 
eventually wholeheartedly demanding that Sarah and her husband be banished from her kingdom for their supposed theft. In the final moments of the movie, Queen Anne and Abigail, who's of course living her high status life, begin to take out the rabbits to play with them. Abigail, fed up with playing with the rabbits, quietly begins to crush one with her foot. Queen Anne eventually asks Abigail, despite her newfound life in the upper class and lifestyle of lavish and extravagant parties, to once again please her sexually. Abigail, knowing that she still does not have the power to refuse, as the queen did in fact give her her power in the kingdom and surely can easily take it away, reluctantly agrees and begins to do so. Anne's face, as this action goes on, Abigail's face, and lastly the rabbits, all seemingly miserable, become superimposed on top of one another for a roughly three minute sequence before this movie goes to credits. The last shot and or the ending of The Favorite to some could be described as frustratingly ambiguous, but I really do think it perfectly sums up this movie and doesn't leave as much to imagination as you think. The Favorite is ultimately about a rivalry between two very ambitious women to gain the affection of Queen Anne. One woman, Emma Stone's Abigail, is so steadfast in gaining a high important position in the Queen's Council because she's known what it's like to have nothing being gambled away in a card game by her father, and being forced to live with an older German man who sexually assaulted her, she literally cannot fail, as failure means going back to her lowly position in society, a punishment worse than death for her. Her ascent to becoming a lady throughout the film, and the opportunities that present themselves like marrying Samuel and performing sexual favors to the Queen, are all means of growing out of her position. There may be some small part of her that likes the Queen, that likes Samuel, but it's clear that at the end of the film, when we see Abigail flirting with other men at a party and hardly paying notice to her husband and later crushing one of Queen Anne's rabbits with her foot, that just about everything she did in her rise to status was an act. Things that she merely put up with to achieve an end. Sarah, on the other hand, at the end, has flat out lost the battle for Queen Anne. Outfoxed by Abigail and dismissed from the court, presumably never to see the Queen ever again, after threatening the Queen with blackmail and being accused of stealing money. Despite all this and Sarah's threats and false accusations, she truly is the only one in the kingdom who truly loves the Queen, even if her love for the Queen is slightly rooted in her own aspirations. In a line when Sarah's being forced out of the castle, Queen Anne says, I wish you could love me as she does, referring to Abigail, who Anne wrongly believes loves her. Sarah replies, you wish I could lie to you. Anne has confused flattery for love and kicks out the one person who doesn't flatter her or doesn't tell her that she doesn't look like a badger when she clearly does, or overall needlessly lie to her to achieve her own agenda. When Anne asks why Sarah is so brutally honest and harsh to her sometimes, hurting her feelings, Sarah even says, because I will not lie, that is love. Sarah is Anne's tether to reality, but despite that, Anne still ignores her. By the end, Abigail has won the battle of the favorites, but it's clear that Queen Anne has chosen the wrong woman. Abigail cares nothing about the Queen's happiness, just maintaining her own station, and in screening the mail and removing Sarah's letter to the Queen, the Queen becomes frustrated about Sarah's silence, which eventually leads to using Abigail's clearly fabricated accusations that she stole from the kingdom to banish her and her husband. The Queen, when Abigail brings these false accusations to her, begins to see Abigail as less as the innocent, kind woman, and more the manipulative liar that she truly is, the woman Sarah claimed she was but cares more about causing pain to Sarah than calling out Abigail. Abigail has not played fair to get to where she is, betraying her morals and causing great pain to others to win, so it is a pyrrhic victory. Abigail is no Sarah, she has no idea how to carry the power that she's gained, and certainly doesn't do so with the grace of Sarah. Abigail seemingly imagined reaching a place where she could exist as her own person, not having to please anyone beside herself, which at first it seems she's reached at the end of the movie, when she ignores her husband who she once brought such pleasure. But once Queen Anne invites her to rub her legs at the end of the film, clearly asking for another sexual favor, Abigail realizes this pyrrhic victory. She realizes that she is, no matter her status, forever bound to give the Queen meaningless pleasure, and the Queen, without her true love Sarah, is forever destined to seek this meaningless pleasure from a lady who she deep down knows has no feelings of affection for her. Both ladies are living in their mistakes and personal hells, and in a certain sense sentenced to live a life of misery. A life for Abigail of never truly having personal autonomy, or having to be a pleasure maiden for someone else, and a life for the queen of never being told the truth by anyone, and also never being loved by anyone, just using her power to stage sad recreations of her time with Sarah, never having the real thing. Lanthimos may very well be implying that Sarah may have been the ultimate winner of the war of favoritism after all, being free from the toxic nature of the Queen's court, and clearly being the one Anne cares for the most. Anne grabs Abigail's hair as she performs this sexual act, and her and Abigail's dead faces, both miserable and extracting no real pleasure from this favor, are superimposed on top of each other, forever binding them together. Lanthimos then adds another superimposed element into this three minute long sequence, Queen Anne's rabbits, which again Anne claims there are 17 for each of her dead children. These rabbits are symbols of her children who either died as miscarriages or at young ages, 
But as Anne states earlier in the film, each one that dies, a little bit of you goes with them. Playing with these rabbits is an attempted recreation of what it'd be like playing with her children, an activity she does in their memory, but doing so is obviously a shell of the actual experience of having children. It's her attempt to salvage the terrible misfortune she has suffered, but she knows rabbits are nothing like the real thing, and derives a similar empty pleasure from playing with them, as too much of her was actually lost when she lost each one of her children. The empty pleasure she gets from the rabbits is similar to the empty pleasure she receives from Abigail, nothing like the real thing. Also, moments ago in the movie, Abigail had used her shoe to try to crush one of the rabbits, as if she is above them and more powerful than these animals that are the queen's playthings, but at the end, she exists in the same final shot as them, which is Lanthimos saying that she holds about as much power in relation to the queen as one of the rabbits do. The rabbits and Abigail were once seen as cute and harmless, but with the last shot, they exist with a much darker implication, of lacking freedom. Abigail is merely a cage plaything that the queen can take out whenever she likes. Abigail and Anne are living in a hell of their own making, exemplified by this purposely messy, unappealing, ultimately lifeless final shot. Abigail has ignored the legitimacy of Queen Anne's personal trauma, but now she is living inside of it, and Anne has ignored her one tether to truth and reality, Sarah, and now she will live out the rest of her days in an empty fantasy. Okay everybody, that's my interpretation of the ending of Yorgos Lanthimos' The Favorite. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to press that like button and subscribe to my channel for more movie related content. Also, tell me below what you thought of this movie and this movie's ending, or even more specifically, that final shot. What's your interpretation of it? I always like hearing that stuff. Thanks again for watching. Feel free to follow me on Twitter, at RealCook, and I'll see you next time.